Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Anisha. I, the pronouns I use are she and her. I am a black woman with brown hair. I have on gold earrings today and a red turtleneck with a white background. All right, I wanna start off by thanking, thanking everyone for the invite to be here today and to share with you. I'm grateful for the opportunity and I look forward to sharing some of my information with you. My first task today, as Teresa mentioned, is to provide you with a general overview of Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Before I do so, I do wanna put out the disclaimer that while I will cover a general framework of the ADA, whether an employer has violated the ADA is often a fact-intensive inquiry, and therefore the analysis varies from case to case, employer to employer, and complainant to complainant. But no matter the facts, the end goal of the ADA, and specifically Title I of the ADA, ADA is to eliminate discrimination in the workplace. And so during these 10 minutes I have, I don't wanna keep you all too long. I do wanna to get to the question and answer portion, but I will cover what is the ADA, how is the ADA structured? And then I'll get into Title I and talk about who has to comply with the ADA, what employers are required to comply with the ADA, and who does the ADA protect? All right, so what is the ADA? The Americans with Disabilities Act is a civil rights statute that was passed in 1990. So it's approximately 31 years old. In the very first section of the act, Congress laid out the act's findings and purpose. Importantly, Congress recognized that up until the time of the act's passage or the enactment, individuals who have experienced discrimination on the basis of disability often had no legal recourse to redress such discrimination. And so with that in mind, Congress enacted the ADA. And the overarching goal of the ADA is to protect the rights of individuals with disabilities to be employed, um, to visit their favorite restaurant or attend a sporting event without fear of discrimination, or at the very least to give them some kind of recourse if they do experience discrimination. In 2008, the ADA was amended by the ADA Amendments Act to provide further protection against discrimination to individuals with disabilities. Significantly though, the Amendments Act stated that the definition of disability should be interpreted in favor of a broad coverage of individuals. All right, so now that we know what the ADA is, let's talk very briefly about how it's structured. The ADA has five titles, if you will. Title I deals with employment, and that's gonna be our focus today. Title II covers discrimination by public entities, such as state or local governments, and the provision of public accommodations. Title III deals with discrimination in public accommodations and services operated by private entities. And when we're talking about a public accommodation, we're talking about a restaurant, a hotel, a museum, a movie theater. As a public law, the ADA contained a Title IV, um, but when the ADA became a part of the United States Code, that section was codified elsewhere in the US Code. And then finally, there's a Title V, which is titled the Miscellaneous Provisions. Um, there are significant provisions in this section of the ADA, specifically section 12203, which prohibits retaliation against any individual because the individual has opposed discrimination made unlawful by the ADA. All right, so now we know what the ADA is, we know how it's structured, let's talk about Title I. The general provision of Title I says that no coverage entity shall discriminate against a qualified individual on the basis of disability in regard to job application procedures, the hiring, advancement, or discharge of employees, employee compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. So that's what the ADA covers, hiring, discharge, um, advancement, job training. So what employers are subject to and what employers have to abide by and comply with the ADA, specifically Title I of the ADA? You noticed in the, the provision I said, it says no covered entity shall discriminate. So what is a covered entity? A covered entity is an employer, employment agency, labor organization, or joint labor management committee. And I think a lot of us focus on the employer aspect of that definition of covered entity. So what is an employer? In general terms, an employer is a person or organization engaged in an industry affecting commerce who has 15 or more employees. 
So if I work at a restaurant and there are only five employees there, it's unlikely that that employer would be subject to or have to comply with the ADA. If I work somewhere and there are 20 employees, on the other hand, that employer is subject to the ADA. It's important to know, however, that an employer does not include the United States or a corporation wholly owned by the United States. So if I work for the Department of Treasury or the Department of Health and Human Services, for instance, they are not subject to the ADA, although they are subject to other federal statutes and laws which impose the same requirements as the ADA. The definition of an employer under the ADA does include state employers, not federal employers, but it does include state employers. All right, so now we've gone through what is the ADA. We've gone through how is it structured. We're into Title I, and we know that if my employer is employing more than 15 people, 15 or more people, he or she is likely subject to the ADA and has to comply with it. And we also know that the ADA is covering hiring, it's covering advancement, it's covering discharge. I'm protected from discrimination in all of those areas. But who specifically is protected? And in order to understand who the title, who Title I protects, I think we need to understand three definitions. Title I of the ADA protects qualified employees with disabilities. All right, I'll say that one more time. Title I of the ADA protects qualified employees with disabilities. So let's better understand each of those aspects. What is an employee? I think when Congress wrote the ADA, they thought they all, we all had a common sense understanding of what an employee is, and I think we do. The statutory definition of employee is an individual employed by an employer, right? So I think we all understand what that means and who an employee is. There are exceptions and caveats and unique scenarios that unfortunately, given our time here today, I cannot dive deeply into, but just know the general understanding is if you are employed by an employer, whether for short time or full time, you are covered under the ADA. Um, and so now understanding what an employee is, now we need to understand what it means to be a disabled employee, okay? Under the ADA, a person is an individual with a disability if he or she falls into one of the following categories. An individual with an actual disability, an individual with a record of a disability, or an individual who is regarded as or treated as if he or she has a disability. We'll get into defining disability, but a record of a disability means maybe I had cancer five years ago and I have a record of having cancer. Regarded as perhaps I have a spouse who has HIV and my employer is aware of that and automatically assumes that I have HIV as well. That's being regarded as having a disability. Okay, so the three categories under the ADA, I am disabled if I have an actual disability, a record of a disability, regarded as or treated as if I have a disability. What does it mean to have a disability under the ADA? A disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of an individual. There's a lot to unpack there, right? Given our time here today, I do not have time to explain you know, go through all of the possible physical and mental impairments that are covered under Title I of the ADA. I can, however, direct you to the regulations implementing the ADA. And specifically, it's 29 Code of Federal Regulations, so 29 CFR Part 1630. 29 CFR Part 1630. And there you will find an extensive, not an exhaustive, but an extensive list of what it means to have a physical or mental impairment. Similarly, you will also find a list, again, not exhaustive, but extensive of what it means, what a major life activity is. Because remember, in order to have a disability under the ADA, I have to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits my, one of my major life activities, right? Sleeping, walking, eating, lifting, bending, thinking, working. These are just a few examples of major life activities, all right? So we know that I am an employee if I'm in, employed by an employer, which is simple enough. Uh, I am disabled if I have an actual disability, I'm regarded as having a disability, or I have a record of a disability, again, which is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. 
but that's not enough. Remember, there were three aspects. I have to be a qualified employee with a disability. And so briefly, with the time I have left, I'll just explain what it means to be a qualified employee. A qualified employee under the Title I of the ADA is someone who is capable of performing the essential functions of the job sought with or without a reasonable accommodation, right? So it means, do I meet the prerequisites for the position or program, such as educational background, experience, skills, or licenses? And then am I able to perform the essential functions of the job? Not the extra functions, not the not so important functions, but the essential functions of a job with or without a reasonable accommodation. Now, a reasonable accommodation is a loaded term and we could have a, you know, a webinar solely on that. But basically a reasonable accommodation is something that's going to look different for different people. Um, it's going to vary depending on the position or the job that you have. But overall, it's a, some examples are a physical modifications to a workplace or flexible scheduling of duties or provision of assisted, assistive technologies. These are some of the examples of a reasonable accommodation. And a reasonable accommodation is something that your employer under the ADA is required to provide unless he or she can, can show that it would create an undue burden with regards to costs or difficulty of implementing the reasonable accommodation. All right, so I don't wanna go over too much, but I will say what we've covered is, you know, what is the ADA, ADA? how is it structured? Talking about Title I, remember an employer is someone who employs more than 15 people. An employee is someone um, who is employed by an employer, right? And so if I'm a qualified employee with a disability, I am covered under the ADA. All right, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Anisha. And thanks for that great overview of Title I of the ADA. Before we dive into the panel, I just have a quick housekeeping note. Our event is included for CLE credit. Um, you will just need to keep listening for the code that you would need to fill out in the form that we sent with the event information. Um, if you didn't get that email, we can provide that at the conclusion of the call, um, but just listen for the code that you'll need for the CLE credit. So now we're gonna transition into the panel portion of today's conversation. Um, I'd like for my panelists to join us by video um, so that we can have a deeper understanding of what Anisha covered about Title I of the ADA and understanding how it um, works in practice um, by the amazing panelists that we have here today. So again, um, we're talking about the basic protections under the ADA in the workplace, as well as the interactive process that the law prescribes. So my first question, and, and this question will start with you, Anisha, how do employees actually request accommodations? Sure, this is Anisha speaking again. Um, I want, when answering that question, I want to start from the backdrop of there's no requirement that you disclose your disability to your employer. Um, you may attempt to work without an accommodation or only request accommodation if you feel you need it to perform your job. But I cannot stress enough that if you will need a reasonable accommodation to be deemed a qualified employee, in other words, someone able to perform the essential functions of your job, then you should make your disability known to your employer and you should then ask for a request for accommodation. Um, when asking for an accommodation, you're not required to use legal terms, all right? You don't have to say reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification, but your request must be sufficiently direct and specific um, to give notice to your employer that you need a special accommodation. Uh, while the onus is on the employee to request a reasonable accommodation, if an employer notices that an employee may need a reasonable accommodation, but just does not know how to ask for it, the employer should do what it can to help. Um, when asking for a reasonable accommodation, who you should ask is going to differ um, where you work. If, if where you work has an HR department, it's likely you, you should go to the HR department, but that is something that's gonna differ from employer to employer and job to job. Um, once you have made your reasonable accommodation known, it's important that you understand 
that your employer generally should not disclose that to coworkers or others unless the person needs to know, right? If it's a supervisor that needs to know of the reasonable accommodation, then he or she could be let, made known about it. But other than that, they are not permitted under the ADA to disclose it to any and every coworker that you have. Describing that, I like to dive deeper into the process. So after you disclose and, and request an accommodation, what is the interactive process like? What are what's required? So this question is for Bethany. Can you walk through an example of the interactive process um, for requesting an accommodation? Absolutely. Um, I'm Bethany Drucker. I um, go by she, her. I am a um, red hair now. Um, it, it could change red hair, Caucasian woman wearing a black and white dress with a green necklace. I'm in my home office, which um, is a little busy looking in the background, gray with some paintings and a portion of an elliptical. And one of my paralegals, which is a, a black pug dog that I'm going to put her back down. <laughs> so if you hear snoring, it's not a bored person, it's my dog. So thank you very much for having me here. And I will give my email out to everyone who wants to answer, ask a question at any point in time, any point in time. Um, and I will give my personal email because I get too many work emails. And I will type that in the message board. So that way, Teresa, if you can facilitate that everyone uh, gets that as well. So the interactive pro, oh, to us, a little background, I am general counsel of a light industrial staffing company. So we have about 10,000 to 13,000 employees. And we do our best to accommodate every single one. And these are, in my opinion, some of the most important employees in the United States. They are essential workers. They are people that cannot work from home. They have to show up in person to work in a factory, a distribution center. And most of these people, they, they don't know to go ahead when they start to ask for a reasonable accommodation. They may not know till they're at the job whether they need something. So I have a lot of leeway with people if they didn't ask ahead of time and they were aware maybe they needed one because these are people who really may not understand what it takes. Maybe they've never gone to a job or gotten an employee handbook that expels out what their rights are. So what, what we do and what I encourage all employers to do is if you as an employer are aware that a person is struggling, whether they're going to the bathroom very often, maybe they have diabetes, maybe they're taking medicine, maybe they're pregnant. Um, do they need a if you see someone struggling and it's whether they have an obvious disability, that would be someone who um, is blind, is deaf, is those are obvious or using a cane. But the less obvious ones, employers should always ask someone, do you need help? What's going on before taking any adverse action? Once an employee states in any any fashion they see, whether they complain to a supervisor or HR and say, I'm having some medical issues, or I just had back surgery, or I'm, they may not know what ADA even is. The minute an employer, an employee notifies the employer or the supervisor where they're working that there is an issue that is preventing them from performing the essential functions of the job, the interactive process is triggered. So and as Aisha had stated, there are no magic words and there's no magic process for that. But the interactive process is so imperative that the employer immediately reaches out to that employee and says, I'm gonna schedule an interactive process with you and explain what that is. It is the, it is the process by which the employer and the employee get to explore a couple things. One, is this person even a qualified individual under the ADA? 
as was spelled out earlier, can this person, is this person qualified for this position? And can this person perform the essential functions of this position with or without a reasonable accommodation that does not amount to an undue hardship? Very few things amount to undue hardship. Um, that's a whole other, you know, that, that's a whole other gambit. I'll give you an example of what would be an undue hardship. Um, I have cancer and I'm epileptic, so I don't drive. If I said, I want this job that involves me driving this Maserati across country, I'm not qualified under any, anything. No one wants me behind a wheel. So that is an example of an undue hardship. They couldn't facilitate this car to make me drive it. Um, one day they might. So for the interactive process, the most important thing is the employer is empathetic and understands the employee has a disability, whether it's a record of, a perceived, and it's perceived or actual. So that you can, I'll give my email, it's perceived or actual. So if an employer thinks someone is disabled and they're not, they still have to treat them correctly under the ADA. That is, it's perceived or actual. But the interactive process involves many steps and it's not a one size fits all. We have um, an employee right now who has anxiety and ADHD and is struggling filling a production order because it's at a rapid pace. So that in this person also does not want to engage in a verbal interactive process because it um, brings anxiety to this person. So we are accommodating the interactive process to help this person via email versus verbal because that makes this person feel better and they, something that they can address. So the interactive process, you may have to provide a reasonable accommodation for the interactive process. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. And it's not an undue hardship on a business to email or text. And then what would this person has, has yet to really identify how it would help this person perform the essential functions of the job. So it may very well be that because they're unaware of how they can, they can meet this production needs, which involves a lot of hand picking and dexterity, maybe this position isn't the one for them, but we can put them and it's our job to find the vacancy. It's our job as the employer to find a suitable position to put them in. It is not their job to say, hey, do you have this open? or that open, it's on the employer. So everyone should remember that, that the employer really has to take the lead here. The employee is the one that initiates and says in some way to an employer that a reasonable person would find is asking for some form of help or putting awareness on that they do have a disability. The rest is on the employer to start and facilitate the process. Now, if the employee decides they're not going to partake and they're not going to contribute to this interactive process, then there's a breakdown in the interactive process. And sometimes it, it, people get frustrated and they, they leave and maybe they go get an attorney. But again, the employee has to, has to be a part of the process. It can't be unilateral. So I can't, I urge everyone with a disability to never be ashamed of anything going on and make sure that you ask for what you need. The worst that happens is they say no and you look for another accommodation. Remember that as long as you stay in the process and are cooperative, the employer will find you a reasonable accommodation unless it's an undue hardship. And again, I almost, I've been doing this for quite some time and I have over 10,000 employees. I have never seen an undue hardship, um, never seen an undue hardship. So again, be creative and especially with, everything is a, is, is a very fluid situation. What maybe was an undue hardship or not a reasonable accommodation six months ago, teleworking is the norm now. So there are certain things people can do. Maybe you can't lift 50 pounds all day long to do that position. 
Perhaps maybe they put someone else to help that. Maybe there's a device to help lift things. There are creativity is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And remembering that these are human beings. We are all human beings and really trying to work together. The interactive process is not, there's not a formula for it. It really involves people engaging together to find a solution. And again, I can't stress enough how important it is for the employee to stay active in it. Don't get frustrated. I've seen too many employees just quit and yet they weren't done with the interactive process. So always stay in it. Never be ashamed of asking for help. Never be ashamed of the process. And employers, um, document, 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 document. That, that is for employers, document. Uh, if you make a, an offer to the employee for a reasonable accommodation, document. If they, don't, if they can't perform it or they ask for something else, document. It is so important, not just, it protects everyone. So the employee gets to see what was offered and the employer also covers themselves. And oftentimes employees may be inundated with or overwhelmed with options or insecurities or not sure what's going on. This way they have a documented record to say, oh yeah, you know what? That one's okay, I can work with that. So it, it's like when you haven't gone food shopping and you open up your refrigerator and you don't like anything, then finally you're like, yeah, that jar of mustard doesn't look too bad. So you have to keep your eyes open and your ears open and your hands and your reading and whatever it is you can do. If you think there's a way you can perform that job, you say it. It may sound, it may be, it's unconventional, but I've seen a lot of things work. So again, stay on the, the interactive process is a conversation. It's a way to find a solution. And there's not one perfect way to do it other than stay engaged, document, be respectful, and hold all of the documentation uh, in a confidential file because it is protected by HIPAA. Again, they remember that for employees, employers, it's protected by HIPAA employees. Um, always make sure you can ask the employer, is, who is this being disclosed to? Who is going to know? Because the employer should tell you, well, this will have to go to the supervisor. This will have to go to your manager. And employers do not have to ever say what the disability is. They just have to say a reasonable accommodation per the ADA has been granted. You don't have to give more information than that. And I stress to employers, don't. Less is more. Um, That's great. I hope that made sense. Yes. <laughs> and if anyone, I, I can, I mean, that, I, I have tons of examples that I'll give my email address, I'll type it in, and people can always ask. Um, I get maybe six or seven a week. Um, I work really hard to accommodate people, and my boss accommodates me. I work from home, have worked from home pre COVID, so I'm always working. Um, but Again, we are in a wonderful time that the stigma of having disabilities is being little by little more and more removed. And we're seeing more of ourselves in the workplace and no longer a secret. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bethany. And thanks for, for walking through the, the process and the tips to keep in mind. Um, I'd love to turn to, to Ginny next here for my next question. Um, kind of hearing about the process as Bethany described, what are some of the common barriers and, and problems that workers with disabilities might face from employers, you know, in tempting to go through this process and exercise their rights? Hi everyone, my name is Ginny Kim. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an Asian woman with a bob wearing a blue collared shirt and standing um, and behind me is some art from my son. Um, but as Teresa mentioned, I work at Legal Aid at Work. We're a nonprofit in San Francisco, California, and we primarily represent low wage workers. Um, so I do exclusively um, represent employees and most of our clients are low wage workers. Um, the question about what it is that the employer can do um, is, as Bethany mentioned, 
there is sometimes a misunderstanding of what it means to engage in the interactive process. And some of that may be because of training. Um, in, in, with employers who have supervisors or managers that turn over frequently, I find that the training isn't always there. Um, and some of these issues can be resolved if there was more robust training of managers and supervisors. Um, employers these days are getting trained online and those often um, aren't the best ways to train employees. And so there's a misunderstanding of what it means to engage in this interactive process. So really this interactive process is supposed to be robust. So um, it means that the employee has to provide information, the employer has to respond, and it's supposed to be done quickly so that this reasonable accommodation can be granted and implemented. Um, I will not say that it's just on the fault of the employer where some of this doesn't happen. I will say that some of our clients also, as Bethany mentioned, don't always provide the documents or get frustrated by the process. So it is you know, incumbent on both sides to engage in this process. I do also think that there are misconceptions about what employees with disabilities can and cannot do. And employers sometimes will make that decision without even consulting with um, their employees. Um, an example is that we represented someone who had a vision disability and worked in childcare. And the employer did not think that this employee could do childcare just because of his vision disability and took him off the job. And what we said was that the employee can do his job. He does not want to be taken off the job. He's perfectly fine in doing his job. And it really took a lot of education um, with the employer to make that known to the employer that you just can't make these decisions unilaterally. You have to consult with the employer, employee to see if there are issues in being able to perform the job. But the employer does not get the, uh, the choice to make that decision. I also think that there, there, there's a perception that accommodations are going to be burdensome and expensive. As Bethany mentioned, the undue burden um, defense is extremely high and it's very hard to meet that. So I can't imagine even a time where that's happened. Um, a lot of these accommodations are simple. They can be implemented very quickly and they're not expensive. Um, and employers may argue and they may complain about their, uh, their burden to provide accommodations. But my response is that employers have all these mandates on them to provide minimum wage. They have to provide overtime. So accommodations are something that they are responsible for doing. I also think there is some um, sometimes questions about how the ADA interplays with other federal and state laws. Um, for example, the Family Medical Leave Act um, provides leave for employees. And when someone's leave ends, there is an opportunity to uh, uh, extend their leave past the 12 weeks and not all employers, in fact, employers often get that wrong. And once that leave ends after 12 weeks, we often times find that employees are terminated right at the end of the 12 weeks. And so that those issues come up pretty frequently in our practice. This is Teresa. Thanks so much, Jenny, for, for walking us through that. I'd like to kind of follow up a little bit um, about when things do go wrong for, for workers. How, how do they assert their rights under Title I of the ADA when they feel that their employers are discriminating against them and violating the law? And when should they contact a lawyer and what's the benefit of having a lawyer in this situation? So a lawyer can be involved in any, at any time in the process. We often will um, advise employees behind the scenes. So lots of times current employees don't necessarily want a lawyer to you know, jump in and get involved at the beginning. And so we will help current workers with ghostwriting emails. We will help with ghostwriting letters and then see how the process goes. Like they will sometimes try by themselves to advocate for themselves for their accommodations. And then if their employer is not responsive to them, they would, then we will write a letter, demand letter and ask for accommodations. Um, and it really kind of depends on the employee. Some employees want that letter to go out from the outset. And sometimes we may get a better response than if the employee um, themselves is advocating for themselves. Um, if an employee wants to bring a lawsuit down the line, um, they do have to what's called administratively exhaust. Um, so they have to file with an administrative agency. The federal agency is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and there's 300 days for an employee to do that. Uh, many states have their own um, state agency as well. Um, but, you know, when these issues of work and livelihood come into play, they're very personal. 
And we spend so many hours working that a lot of times employees um, you know, get very emotional about them. And it sometimes helps to have a lawyer involved so that that third party can be involved and advocate for the, the employee where sometimes they feel like they can't do it themselves. Um, so I do think that you know, just reaching out to a, a lawyer, even if you don't engage with them and just talking about the process, talking about what's happening is helpful for a lot of employees. And I will add um, sort of that our organization does have sample letters on our website. Um, so if employees are looking to request accommodations, we have sample letters such as a, a letter for leave under both the ADA and under California law. We have letters um, to ask for modified supervision, to ask for telecommuting. We've recently put up letters related to COVID um, to ask for telecommuting. Um, so if you ever want, employee ever wants samples on how to write these letters to their employer, then um, please go on our website and um, download some of those samples. This is Teresa. That's great, Jenny. Thank you for those resources and for those examples as well. Um, I'm going to pause here for another housekeeping item. Um, so for any attorneys who are listening to this uh, presentation and need CLE credit for this event, the course code that you need to remember and write down is the letter Q. Um, again, the course code is Q, which is Q as in the word quit. Uh, so those are that's for CLE credit. Um, so now back to the the panel. I'd like to shift gears a little bit here um, and talking about moving forward. So um, where do we go from here? On we've been a little bit over thirty years of the ADA um, and the importance of Title One um, is definitely clear, but. Who does Title I fail to protect? Are there any loopholes? And I'll go in reverse order here. So I'm gonna start with you, Ginny. Um, if you could talk to a little bit about um, any gaps that um, Title I fails to protect. So as Anisha mentioned, um, the ADA protects employers or protects employees who work for employers with 15 or more employees. So if you work for an employer with less than 15 employees, you're not covered by the ADA, although you may be covered by your state law. Um, the ADA does not protect independent contractors, so that's coming up a lot in terms of gig workers. There's also exceptions for Native American tribes and some private membership clubs like fraternities, sororities, and country clubs. And also what's coming up recently in COVID, the ADA does not protect um, or provide for reasonable accommodations of an associated person. So for example, a parent with a child with a disability um, would not be protected and there is no obligation on the employer's part to provide accommodation because of the employee's associated child. Um, and that's been coming up for us a, a lot recently, although there are efforts in our state to try to get that clarified with our state law. And then I would say that there is sometimes a disconnect between the protections under the ADA and then what happens in someone's real life and experience, right? The ADA, as Anisha mentions, provides protections from discrimination and retaliation, and it provides that employers must provide reasonable accommodations. At the same time, not everyone is ready to make the disclosure about a disability. And that's often a very personal decision. So on the one hand, there's the ADA and people know about it, but on the other hand, we often hear from clients that they're just not ready to do that, either because um, that's not something that they feel comfortable with, they don't trust their employer, they're new or they're on probation. So there is sort of that disconnect um, that happens in the real world. That's great to hear. And I think you touched a little bit upon my, my next question in that there's there's ways that state law can provide additional protection. So I'd like to, to ask Anisha, can you describe a little bit about the, the interplay of state laws and providing additional protection to workers with disabilities? Sure, sure. Um, there are some states um, such as California and New York where they specifically provide that their anti-discrimination laws use the ADA as a floor. So they can require more than the ADA does and protect more people. Um, also, most states do not have a damages cap the way that Title I does. So Title I has a damages cap where if your employer has a certain amount of employees, there's a certain amount of uh, compensation you can recover for this, the discrimination you face. Most states do not have that kind of cap. Um, 
if there is a state law, if a state law is less protective than the ADA, you are not limited to the state law. Um, if the state law is more protective, you can use both the ADA and the state law. So those are some of the ways where state laws and the ADA are, you know, are different and then some ways in which they aid one another. That's great. And I think my next question is, is for, for Bethany. Um, what other limitations exist in, in Title I and what could be improved about the ADA to, to cover a wider swath of disabilities and be more effective? Well, the ADA is coming a little bit further now in case law as far as covering more um, disabilities, which is helpful. And I also urge employees, if, um, the disability is it limits a life function or, or people can really work with that. But one issue um, where there's a huge disconnect between the Title I and the EEOC is the EEO1 report. That does not include the listing of persons with disabilities in any category. It, it's, um, it's race and gender for the um, EEO1 report. And why that is so important is because companies, for instance, like NASDAQ excluded, omitted individuals with disability in their diversity initiative because there is no data for persons with disability. And that is true because the EEO1 report, which is the vessel for which companies and the, everyone gets the data does not include individual disabilities. So I would like to see the uh, EEOC really work in the framework of Title I so that way more companies are held accountable. So accountability, goodwill is one thing, but actual accountability is another thing. Um, so I think that's something with the Title I that has to change. Illinois is, is a very accommodating state when it comes to persons with disability. The Seventh Circuit is more employer friendly than employee friendly. So what I mean by that is it's often on the, the burdens often shifted a lot more to the employee than the employer. So what happens in the each, there's no uniform across all the states. So there's a lot of data and judicial disparity that comes with Title I. And I think it has to be more uniform. There, there's so many different fiefdoms on how to decipher Title I, but everyone is still an individual with a disability trying to earn a living. So at the end of the day, you have the same problem being handled in 50 different ways. I think there has to be more uniformity. That's great. Thank you, Bethany, and, and thank you to our great panelists. I'm gonna transition to the Q&A and thank you to those who have put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I know we're coming up on the hour, so we may not get to your question, but our, our panelists have so graciously put their, their contact information in the chat and we can also provide that afterward. Um, so the first question that well, we've had in the chat is, um, what is the statute of limitation, the, the time frame for any ADA violation that an employer may have made? Um, Ginny, let's start with you. Do you have an answer to that? I think you're on mute. Thank you. So if you're gonna be filing with the EEOC, which is a federal agency, then you have 300 days from the last violation um, if you're, you have a state with uh, their own agency, then it's oftentimes different statute and oftentimes longer. For example, in California, we recently passed legislation so that it's three years here in California. Great. Thanks for that. And one other last housekeeping, um, for those who might've missed the CLE code, um, that code is the letter Q, Q as in quit the letter Q. Okay, great. So now that we've talked a little bit about the, the statute of limitation um, and, and filing, um, let's talk a little bit something that is definitely growing in light of the pandemic. Um, does the ADA cover individuals who can't be vaccinated? Um, some employers are choosing to decide whether they should require folks to come back to the workplace and, and have a vaccination on file. Um, so I'm going to start this question with Anisha, but Phil, anyone else feel free to jump in. Do our ADA, does the ADA cover those who cannot be vaccinated? 
So this is, of course, is a great question. It's a question that everyone is starting to ask. Um, the EEOC actually just provided guidance on this. I think it was in December. So I would direct you to take the time. There's a question and answer that really goes through what an employer responsibilities are and what they can do in a time such as COVID. Um, to discuss whether or not they can require a vaccination, um, employee, employers are allowed to have a qualification standard that includes a requirement that an individual shall not pose a direct threat to the health or safety of individuals, right? So employers are technically permitted to find that not being vaccinated poses a direct threat to the safety of others. With that being said, they still have a responsibility and are required to have reasonable accommodations, right? And so the reasonable accommodation as Bethany mentioned earlier that a lot of people are having is allowing you to work remotely, right? So while they may say you cannot come into the office if you're not vaccinated for, and, and if that's due to a disability, you're not vaccinated, but they have to work with you to try to come up with a reasonable accommodation. Again, there's the caveat that it cannot pose an undue burden with respect to costs or difficulty, but I think this time is showing us that working remotely is something that an overwhelming number of the work, people in the workforce can do. And so they are required to take those steps and go through the interactive process. Great, thanks Anisha. Any last thoughts on, on that question, Jenny or Bethany? We're obviously going through that um, at my company where, and, and how, how I'm handling it with our corporate staff, anyone who's uh, uncomfortable or does not want to get the vaccine, they have their very quick interactive discussion with me. And if they have any concerns, whether it's ADA or religion, and the, and, uh, the EEOC spells out that it doesn't, any religious belief, and you really, it's, you can't question too much into that. Um, they do get a pass on the vaccine. So there's a lot of people coming to me saying, you know, I'm breastfeeding. I don't want the vaccine. I, I'm concerned. And that's enough for me. That's enough for me. So, and, um, and we still have this great tool that people can wear masks and face shield. So that is a reasonable accommodation. It has been going on throughout the time. Essential workers were still in the workplace wearing these precautions. So if someone um, can still perform the essential duties of their job, unless it is a, um, a direct threat and the, certain industries can require, maybe those are healthcare settings. But with most employers, um, a little flexibility is very good, especially until people know more about the vaccine. Um, and especially for employers, you want to keep your employees and retain them. It, it's a little goodwill goes a long way, again, unless it's a direct threat. But for a reasonable accommodation, face shields, really good masks, some gloves, plexiglass dividers, if someone can't work from home, those are always a possibility. I would just and add listen to your employees. That's it. Listen. I would just add to keep up on the EEOC guidance on this because they often update and sometimes change their guidances depending on how the circumstances change. Great. Well, we are running low on time, so I'm going to wrap up uh, our event for today. Um, thank you to Ginny Kim, Bethany Drucker, and Anisha Queen for joining us and sharing your expertise with us today. I speak on behalf of all of our, our attendees that this has definitely been very insightful and very educational and definitely um, pressing topics that we need to keep in mind as we continue to advocate for disability inclusion in the workplace and in society. I do want to thank also our, our hosts and sponsors for today, um, to Weill Law Firm, um, to NYU's Disability Organization, and to the Disability, National Disabilities uh, Disabled Law Students Association. For, for those attorneys who, again, are needing um, CLE credit, um, again, that code is the letter Q, Q as in quit. And so um, you can use that code to um, count for that credit and fill out the form. Um, this event was also recorded, so we will be sharing the recording at a later date, and we will send that out to all attendees that registered. 
And if you need any more information, I encourage you to check out the National Disabled Law Students Association website. That is ndlsa.org. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Jordan Berger. Her email is jordan.berger at ndlsa.org if you have any follow-up questions from this event. But with that, again, Ginny, Anisha, Bethany, thank you for being here. And thank you audience for joining us today and continue to lead on for disability inclusion. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.